The Bane Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, farms turn out to be upside down root systems from vast underground civilizations run by silicon based octopuses who do not like using Latin plurals when speaking English. Island zombie hopping and drunken fireball wizards. Plus, we continue the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's uncompromising honor. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. We talked to A.J. Haskins this time about his new novel, Blood and Whispers. This is a really cool debut fantasy novel about a Philadelphia consulting investigator on a ritual murder who also happens to be the local reigning wizard within the Arcanum. And a bit of a drunk, too. Fun stuff, and we'll hear more about that in a moment. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Honor Harrington series masterpiece, Uncompromising Honor. Now here's the news. Hey, March whistles in with the Tim Powers Modern Fantasy ebook sale. March discounts on ebooks from the strange and wonderful mind of multiple World Fantasy Award winner Tim Powers. $2 off the ebook, Forced Perspectives. $1 off ebooks, Alternate Route, Earthquake Weather. Expiration date and down and out in purgatory, the collected stories of Tim Powers. Ebook discount supply at all Bain ebook distribution outlets. Sale ends March 31st, 2021, when the clocks strike midnight. Hey, we have Tango Delta on the March hardcovers and original trade paperbacks. That's space control speech for touchdown and ready to read. First off the rocket is At the End of the Journey by Charles E. Gannon. Six mismatched teenagers and their crusty British captain were out at sea when the world ended. Now they must step up to leadership or face disaster. They must seek others who were fortunate enough or tough enough to have made it through the zombie apocalypse. If they can, then maybe, just maybe, the plague won't be the end of humanity's journey forever. Also out in original trade paperback is Blood and Whispers by A.C. Haskins. Thomas Quinn is a sorcerer, haunted by the memories of the things he's done over centuries of service to the Arcanum. He has long retired from that life, running an occult shop in Philadelphia for the past several decades. But when two detectives come to his door, asking about a brutal ritual murder in the city, Quinn must reluctantly take up the mantle of a sorcerer of the Arcanum once more. And now out in trade paperback is To Crush the Moon by Will McCarthy. Once the Queendom of Saw was a glowing monument to humanity's loftiest dreams. Ageless and immortal, its citizens lived in peaceful splendor. But as Saw buckled under the swell of an immorbid population, space itself literally ran out. To Crush the Moon by Will McCarthy, Blood and Whispers by A.C. Haskins, and At the End of the Journey by Charles E. Gannon are now available at booksellers everywhere. Well, welcome A.C. Haskins to the podcast. Hey, Aaron. Hey, how's it going? Pretty good. A.C. Haskins is a former armored cavalry officer and combat veteran turned economist and business strategist and occasional defensive firearm instructor. He has a lifelong love of speculative fiction, having written his first science fiction novel as a class project in the 11th grade. I noticed your uh, acknowledgments. You acknowledge your 11th grade. Uh, is it his uh, English teacher? Yeah, I actually sent her a signed copy as soon as I got my, my courtesy copies. That's very cool. His interests include, but are not limited to, ancient and medieval history, mythology, applied violent studies. 
which sounds very violent. Tabletop <laughs> gaming and theoretical economics. He lives in Michigan with his wife, two cats, and a dog. So yep. out now at booksellers is Blood and Whispers by A.C. Haskins. Here's the uh, actual 3D uh, version of it. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, what is that? Todd Lockwood, I believe, is our artist. Yeah. This one. Yeah. It's cool cover. Uh, like that a lot. Um, yeah, I actually so, love that cover so much that I edited a couple scenes in the book to, to match the cover. To make so it look <laughs> like to be inaccurate. <laughs> You're not the first author that 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 has happened with. Um, sometimes we get some great uh, great stuff in from the artist, and it, it inspires the author. <laughs> so, um, so the tagline for the book is um, "A Soldier of the Arcanum," and um, maybe we should start with that. Who is Thomas Quinn? Um, when we meet him, uh, we don't really have a whole lot of spoilers away but we can talk a lot about the uh, world here and yeah. maybe some of his backstory there's a lot um a lot <laughs> of the book is learning who thomas quinn is of course yeah so quinn is uh he's a two and some change century old sorcerer who is just at the start of the book he's basically just this broken down old man crawled into a bottle of whiskey decades prior and just kind of wants to be left alone. And, and uh, he's, he's just very burned out and he's got nightmares, drinks himself to sleep and doesn't really interact with people very much. Um, he runs a bookshop, well, books and, and like uh, occult supplies. But other than that, he doesn't really interact with anyone. He doesn't have any friends, and he doesn't he doesn't maintain any connections really in the world. And well, he likes that bartender that that turns he, into a yeah. He's, he's got a kind of semi professional relationship with his bartender, who kind of is like keeps him informed of things going on in the in the magical world of Philadelphia. But that's. Mm. that's really, yeah, you don't want to get interaction he has aside from customers. Yeah. So he, um, where he is, where the shop is, is Philadelphia. Yeah. Um, yeah. What in it's modern day Philadelphia? This is a this yeah, is a it's urban day. Um, where in Philadelphia? Why did you pick Philadelphia? Because you really seem to have a real um, feel for the city in this book. Yeah. So um, I I call I consider Philadelphia my second hometown, even though I've never actually lived there. Um, my grandparents lived in uh, a suburb of Philadelphia, uh, Bryn Mawr, um, my, my whole childhood. So every summer we'd go visit them. We spent about half our Christmases there. Um, I still have a lot of family in the area. So I love Philadelphia. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's a city that doesn't get enough representation in uh, this type of fiction. Like everything's set in New York or LA. Occasionally you'll get Atlanta, maybe Boston. Uh, yeah, there's just some cities that, that are kind of overlooked in, in fiction and Philadelphia is one that, that you don't get a whole lot of books set there. And you use some real locales in Philadelphia, like the magic garden, uh, yep. which is what it's like this, um, sort of, uh, outsider art thing. Is it real? It's, it's real. Yeah. The, I even explained, I think I threw in a paragraph explaining how it came about and that's, that's basically straight from their website. Like they, is just this, artists just started kind of making murals out of trash and, and just, just turned into this sprawling, it's not big, it's, but it's, it's like three levels and it's inside and outside. And yeah, it's just, it's kind of a really cool place uh, to, to visit. It's a place to set a, a match. So let's, let's get to what it is in the book by sort of um, tell us about the Fae and the other world and, and how uh, the, the, the sages and the sorcerers fit into this world and let's just uh, dive into the uh, setting because it's yeah. so cool. Yeah, so actually in, in uh, undergrad, I studied um, Irish history, especially ancient and medieval Ireland. And so a big part of that is, is studying the folklore and the myth and the, and the legends. So when I started writing a book, I wanted to incorporate that. So um, I, yeah, I, a big part of this world is is the influence of the fae um and they are magical beings that originate in this 
this sister world of ours, this alternate plane of existence called the other world and can travel back and forth between them. But that's, that's where they actually come from versus humans and other magical creatures that are native to earth. Um, and yeah, so at one point in the book, uh, Quinn has to go to the other world and, and uh, talk and deal with some of the Fae and we get to see a little bit of the darker side of, of, of the, the fairies and that's, that's kind of fun. <laughs> but yeah. uh, within this world, there's like a bunch of them who just, you know, they're basically expats and they live on earth, even though they're not from here. And so they have a, a fairy market, well, a set of fairy markets. Every major city in this world has one and they kind of meet once, once a month or so. Um, and that's just kind of one of the big touchstones of, of the local magical community. Because everybody, because you can go there and get stuff. So the humans you get stuff and, and you can just, you can, you can drop your, your glamour and you can just kind of be yourself there and you can interact with friends. So it's kind of a mix of, you know, a flea market and a convention, but you know, every month. Yeah. I pictured it as like, a, as sort of a, sort of a hipster flea market <laughs> yeah and actually uh, one of one of the one of the characters one of the supporting casts in the book actually convinces herself it's not real by by thinking it is a sci-fi convention so <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah um the so uh what is the magic that people can do um and and what why are the, the these are somewhat dangerous uh fairies and and they're mm -hmm. they're the sorts of fairies that or look like people um, and are, are not little creatures, but more like, you know, uh, Tolkien Fay or Mercedes Lackey Fay, that sort of thing. Yeah, right? they're, they're, they're the Eschid, the, the, the high fairies of Irish mythology, Celtic mythology. Um, and so they, they have a very different type of magic than the, than the humans and the other creatures of Earth. And I don't want to, you know, it's, some of that goes into the actual plot of the book. So I don't want to get too, too into the weeds of the mechanics of, of magic in this universe. But um, we, we start in chapter one with Quinn studying the, the ley line network and it's shifting around. And which so is that's, very unusual. Yeah, exactly. So it, and, and uh, yeah, it's essentially sorcery in this world is an ability that people are born with, but they also have to study really hard and train really hard to be good at. So it's, you know, some people are born with the ability to tap into the magical fields in the world around them, but even if they can, then they have to be trained how to do so safely, or they're just, they're gonna hurt themselves and those around them rather than actually be able to, to do anything with it. So- um, And the training like is all, like 27 years. Yeah, the, Ar the Arcanum in this, in this is essentially the organization of sorcerers that was set up um, kind of to keep the peace between humanity and, and the other magical uh, peoples of, of the other world and of Earth. And uh, it, it is the primary organization that trains sorcerers. And, and so, yeah, Quinn and, and all other sorcerers go through a very strict, long yeah, like I said, 27 years, um, long, long apprenticeship to become a ranked sorcerer. The unranked ones who are less powerful, it's much shorter, but they still have, have some, uh, some pretty intense training before, before they're trusted to do magic on their own unsupervised. And they could do, I mean, people like Quinn can do things like if they want to, uh, maybe even, uh, shoot fire. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He does that. He does that, uh, at least once or twice in the book. <laughs> Just don't make him mad. He, well, I mean, that's one of the things about Quinn and his, his sort of uh, broken down nature at the beginning is that he is extremely powerful, right? Mm -hmm. um, and he's used his, his mag talk a little bit about his backstory since it's not a. Yeah. So I don't want to give too much away. Cause like, like you said, a lot of the story is kind of learning his backstory and learning why he is the way he is. But uh, basically he, he uh, spent a good 150 or so years as a soldier um, in, in the forces of the Arcanum battling, you know, magical threats that, that would do harm to humanity or, or threaten the peace between humanity and the Fae and things like that. Um, 
and he's just he's seen some pretty horrible stuff and he's had to do some pretty horrible stuff to to stop those threats and so he's he, he's he's, he's anxious he, hmm? he's pretty old we should mention that yeah that, because you don't I die. think I, I think i specifically cited it as 237 years old something like that <laughs> 1783 or something when he was born yeah some, somewhere and he was born he was born right towards the tail end of the american revolution but he is an irish immigrant yes yes he's yeah. born in ireland with a uh, scottish mother um and, and he was raised in ireland and then came to the states sometime around the american civil war so necessarily or not, maybe not necessarily a lot of the 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 fae that he interact with are of the Irish hierarchy and, and such. So we got a lot of Irish. Yeah. And that's, here. that was part of the draw of setting. Yeah. That was part of the draw of setting it in Philadelphia actually is cause it's a, it's a, got a, such a high Irish immigrant population that it was pretty easy to justify that a lot of the Irish fairies would have kind of ended up there and in any other city that's got a big Irish population. Um, but Philadelphia also has the, the Welsh tract, um, and people who aren't familiar with Philadelphia have probably never heard of it, but but uh, basically to the west of the original settlement of Philadelphia back in, in colonial days was called the Welsh Tract, where a bunch of Welsh folks came and settled, um, set aside by uh, by William Penn. And uh, so that, that also helped play into it, because now that I get to bring in some other Celtic influences. There's some, some Welsh fairies and things like that that, that make appearances as well. Well, I mean, in this world, everybody is eventually in the bucket. Of, <laughs> you've got oh yeah, we have we have Russian fairies. We have we have uh, the Olympians. See, what else we have? The, mm -hmm. You have the Olympians. Yeah, uh, there's there's references to some Native American spirits, and there's all sorts of stuff. Yeah, we yeah. have, we have uh, German and Scandinavian. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's really cool. So all right, so Quinn is a sorcerer. Actually, in the, in the short story that. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, basically. Yeah, I was just going to say in the short story that uh, y'all put on the, the website, I actually have uh, I have a South American monster in there. And yeah, so I, I tried to draw from, while, while my own background is more in the, uh, the Irish and Northern European mythology, I tried to come up with a diverse representation of, of fairies and magical spirits. Well, one of the one of the main secondary characters uh, is um, the grandson of a of a voodoo uh, sorcerer. So, mm -hmm. yeah, who is what Henri uh, Lejoy is his name. So, Henri Lejoy, yeah, Lejoy, yeah. So that's really cool. Yeah. Um, so, what is the Treaty of Terra, and why does it matter? The Treaty of Terra is the. Um, the treaty that ended what what I called the fairy wars or the fey wars. Basically, the the backstory of the Arcanum is um, the with the rise of of Christianity in particular, and then later Islam. Um, the fey lived among humans and alongside humans in pagan societies around the world, and then when these these uh, major religions rose up that essentially saw them as demons, um, it caused some conflict and they started to lose some of their territory as, as the Christians expanded into formerly, you know, the, the heathen lands in Northern Europe and, and the Celtic areas. And, um, and yeah, most of the pre-Christian um, gods and goddesses that, you know, from mythology in this world are, are fair, are fair. Um, and they're just various tribes of faith. So the Olympians are one tribe and things like that. And then with the rise of Christianity and the conflict that that created between humanity and the Fae, while the Fae are a lot more powerful than humans, there's a lot more humans than them. So they just, they can't hope to win, but they can, it, it would have been very bloody if they'd chosen to actually fight. So the Arcanum was set up by human sorcerers as essentially a central organized body not really a government, but, you know, kind of a, uh, just an, an organization that stood between humanity and the Fae and basically told them, you know, you don't get to kill humans. <laughs> when something, even, even though even yeah. you might be mad, but you don't get to kill them. So the Treaty of Terror was the treaty between the Arcanum and the Fae courts. 
that basically establish the rules governing their their interactions in the future. It's at this point, it's about a thousand years old. And even though Quinn is depressed and a little bit of a drunk, he's still the biggest, biggest ass sorcerer in Philadelphia. And oh, yeah. it's his responsibility to look after things like violations of, mm-hmm. of the treaty and things like that. But, yeah. Like, like I said, the Arcanum is not really a governing body, but because it exists to keep the peace and to protect humanity, um, its members have to actually take those responsibilities seriously. And if they don't, then they can either renounce their membership or they basically give up their right to autonomy. And they're basically saying, I I don't want the responsibility of keeping the peace in this area that I've claimed as my territory. So someone else has to come in and do it, do, uh, do that. Since Quinn wants to be left alone, he realizes when the story kicks off when there's when there's some stuff happening in Philadelphia. He has he realizes he has a choice between dealing with this and then getting to be left alone after he's dealt with it, or not dealing with it and then never getting to be left alone again. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of the forcing function that that kicks off the story that that forces him out of his his drunken stupor and into actually interacting with the world. And he's, I mean, and in the end, this is sort of a private eye story. In yeah, it's a, it's a detective private story, consult- a mystery story. <laughs> what has happened? What has happened? What do you mean? That, what, what is the terrible thing that's happened? Oh, it's, it's a murder. Yeah. It's, it's a murder mystery. Uh, um, what we could talk about that because it's the first, you know, it's the setup of the book. <laughs> Let's right. talk about what happened yeah. in that murder and why it particularly is of concern to him. Yeah, so the detectives show up in his shop asking him for help um, because the even people tangentially related to the magical community, so you know occult practitioners, etc., whether they're actually magical or not, um, know that that he's the most knowledgeable person in the city about this stuff. So they these two detectives have this crime scene that looks like essentially like a satanic murder ritual. And they, they go um, before the story, it's, they, they reveal this in their conversation with him, but they had been, uh, they went to the University of Pennsylvania and talked to the professor there trying to get some information about uh, these weird symbols that they found at the, at the scene written in, in blood. And he directed them to Quinn. So they come to him asking him if he knows what these symbols are, if he can help translate them so they can get some insight into into the you know the motive and and so forth background of the killer and he looks at this and realizes that these are actually fey writing and the and then he later discovers after the police leave that the victim or actually it was before the police show up sorry there was some rewriting so i gotta remember what order things go. before the police show up he had learned he had heard rumors that a sorcerer had been killed and it turned out that the victim of this murder this ritual murder was uh a an unranked but arcanum trained sorcerer so not very powerful but he was affiliated with the arcanum he was an actual magic user so between actual fey writing at the scene and the victim he realizes this might actually be a problem so he's got to at least investigate figure out if it if it is a magical threat that he has to deal with or if it's just a common murder that's been dressed up by you know by people to look like that so that that kind of kicks off his investigation is, yeah. And he joined. I mean, after initial some off-putting things at the beginning, he joins forces with these cops who are really cool. They're a great little pair of uh, of, of yeah. for him. Um, who is Henri Lejoie and uh, yeah, what is it, Adrian Connor? Adrian she knows Connors, a lot of stuff yeah. from her from her grandma, right? About yeah, she's yeah. So I wrote her as being from a a very um, very Irish American family. Um, so, and her grandma was actually born and raised in, uh, uh, um, Connemara, which is a part of, of Ireland that they, they still speak Gaelic and, and, uh, and it's out by Galway. Um, so she was an immigrant, um, and taught her granddaughter, all of these, all of these myths and stories that she, that, in, you know, the folklore that she grew up with. Um, so, Con- so Connors isn't a believer, but she knows the background, the mythology. And Henri Lajoie, on the other hand, comes from a, a very broken 
background. He's an orphan immigrant. Um, and uh, he, he's more open to the possibility of magic being real, but he doesn't have the background in, in the mythology and the folk tales. But he is the direct descendant of a major sorcerer. So. Yes, yes. His grandfather was a sorcerer, but he, yeah, but he doesn't know that for sure. It's, There's one other piece we should probably talk student. about, which is that people generally don't know any of this is going on. This is yeah, not. A world it's all world. underground, and that, and that's part of the Treaty of Terra is is because the Fey are afraid of humans, basically, not individual humans, but humanity at large discovering their existence, and especially with modern weaponry, they would stand no chance against against humanity at large. So part of the Treaty of Terra is it's incumbent upon the Arcanum and the Fey to keep magic's existence secret from humanity at large. So it's like a secret underworld. Yeah. So it's cool. I mean, we've got uh, Connor slowly. It, her realization that magic might be real is, is a really cool part of the book because um, she yeah. really is resistant to it. I, I had a lot of fun writing her character. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so there's, there's some other, he thinks that this creature, um, named the Artal Arta, yeah. might have something to do with the, and eventually we meet this thing and it's really, it's like this Hannibal Lecter thing you wrote. Can you sort of, no, we don't have to, I'll just talk about it, that creature and where he is and, and, and such. Yeah. So the Avarta is actually a creature from, from Irish mythology. Um, there's a couple different versions in, in the folklore, but basically he's a vampire, essentially. He's, he was, uh, he was suppo supposedly he would murder and drink the blood of, of people, you know, in, in his territory. Um, he, it, according to the myths, he was killed by Finn McCool or, or various other people, depending on which version you're looking at. But um I, I basically turned him into a an insane fairy who like he's oh he's he's definitely evil but he's also very clearly insane like from from the interaction from the conversation with him he's there's something not quite right with him <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, he just he hates people he he blames humanity for the you know, the downfall of, of the Fey from power and, and basically just wants revenge on them. But uh, I don't, I don't want to give, I don't want to give any spoilers when they go to, uh, when they go to discuss with him, you know, as a potential suspect, um, it's, it's a very interesting interaction, but uh, yeah, they, they, uh, he creeps them out pretty much. <laughs> yeah, he creeps them out, basically. That's that's a good way of putting it. Like they, they come away like very unsettled by it, but but he clearly isn't the bat, you know, he's he's not he's not so much a red herring as they manage to rule him out. Hmm. And then uh there is um Quinn does have a friend. He just hadn't talked to him in a while, and that is Angus, right? The uh yeah, he, yeah, he does have a friend. Yeah, he doesn't really interact with them except on very rare occasion. But yeah, Angus is uh, is also a, a character from traditional Irish folklore. Angus Og, he's the uh, the um, foster son of Nuada, who is the Nuada of the Silver Hand, was the uh, the king of the the Tuatha de Danann when they invaded Ireland in the Book of Invasions, um, and. I, I thought it'd be fun to, he's, he's, he's kind of a fun character in the original mythology. So I thought he would be an interesting primary fairy for, for the audience to get to know. And, you know, he, he's kind of representative of the not evil fae. <laughs> I wouldn't say he's good. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't say he's good in the sense that, you know, all, all fae are dangerous. Um, all fae, they're, they're alien beings who, you know, they have their own, their own motives and their own, their own desires. But as far as fae go, he's probably the closest thing to good in this story. <laughs> um, 
But if you, the one thing that Quinn warns them and that Quinn knows is not to, not to get any kind of legal arrangements or make any, any stray promises. Yeah. Uh, or agree to any favors or even eat fairy food without yeah. making it very clear what the arrangement is. Right. Yeah. There's some kind of, this is the, this is the big deal with the Fey is all this, this very, this, I don't even know what you call it. Sort of a, a legalistic uh, potluck like attitude of you give yeah. me something. If I give you something, then you owe me. Yeah. No, they, they bargain. <laughs> They make deals and they, they recognize only the letter of the law. Um, but yeah, in, in some versions, some interpretations of the Fae that you'll see, like they can't, they can't lie. Um, in my version, they can lie. They absolutely can. Um, unless they have what's called a, a guess, which is a, um, an, a binding rule. And that's also something I, I pulled straight out of Irish mythology where um, like if you break a guess, then you, you can suffer all sorts of backlash, magical backlashes up to and including your own death. Um, and so, yeah, in this, in this version, the fake can lie and they can dissemble and they can deceive unless you manage to, to bind them with this, with a guess that, that will, um, that holds them strictly to the letter of the, the binding enchantment. So that's like the Treaty of Terra, for example, has been laid upon all Fey who who signed it as a guest. And they had they cannot, they physically cannot break any provision of the treaty. They might have some leeway in interpretation sometimes, <laughs> but you know, in terms of the like I said, they, they don't recognize the spirit of the law, only the letter, but they can't break the letter of the law. Yeah. So the um Turn it to the human side of things. One one character that I loved was the immortal Johannes. Um, yeah. Talk a little bit about. We don't have to get into his entire role and everything, but uh, talk a little bit about him and his origin because I thought it was super cool. Um, He's kind of a surrogate father figure for for, for Quinn. Um, when Quinn Quinn had a very traumatic experience early in the twentieth century uh, that's referenced a few times throughout the book. And that was kind of the first time he, he broke and became, you know, just kind of this, this hollowed out shell of a man, you know, lost his will to live and, and all that kind of stuff. And um, while he has a good relationship with his parents, or at least he used to, he doesn't really talk to him now. At that point, uh, Johannes found him and kind of took him under his wing and put him back together. And so he, he became this, surrogate father figure who you know he really respects and he really looks up to but he's also ashamed of the the way he left things when when they left when he last saw him um decades before so while he's referenced a few times in the book he doesn't actually show up until about that almost the halfway point because before then quinn just is too ashamed to even go talk to him like he just, he doesn't want to show his face. He feels bad and doesn't want to, you know, he, he's not really embarrassed. It's really, yeah, shame would be the, the appropriate word there. <laughs> he's like, he's not like a few hundred years old. He's like 10,000 years old. Yeah, no, he's, he is a more, he's older than the Fae. Like he is a true immortal. Um, and and like he's not older than the Fae in theory could get. I, I don't think I ever established in the book how old the oldest of the Fae are. But he is older than any of the Fae that appear in the book. So, <laughs> no. Pretty old, pretty old. And he's watched humanity come from, you know, hunter gatherers and, and up through mud huts and into, you know, landing on the moon and, and the modern world. And he's outside the hierarchy of the, of the sorcerers. Yeah, he has nothing to do with the Arcanum. The Arcanum doesn't even know he exists. Um, he, he is, he keeps to himself. Yeah, this is. I mean, there, there's just so much uh, cool magical richness in in the world, um, but there's also some cool, like just like real life lore. Like you use a lot of Irish whiskey in in this. Book. Yeah. Um, are you a whiskey yeah. connoisseur? Oh, I use you? a lot of Scotch. I think Irish whiskey up here is. It yeah. is Scotch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He drinks a yeah. lot. Oh, I, I'm I'm a Scotch guy myself, so I I tend to default to it. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of nice descriptions of various kinds. 
<laughs> those two. Yeah, I, that's actually uh, my dad read the book, and he that was actually one of his feedback is like uh, he you know he's like I, I really liked it. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the story. Maybe you you mentioned what type of whiskey he's drinking a little too much. <laughs> so like I, yeah, because you know when I'm writing it every scene where he's got whiskey is like weeks or months apart, but when you're reading it, they're, you know, 10, yeah. 15 minutes apart. <laughs> so, well, there's a lot. He drinks a lot. <laughs> John likes the whiskey. Yeah. So it makes, makes him. Yeah, so I, think, I think readers who like scotch would, will enjoy that, but anyone who does it, to, yeah. <laughs> it's a substantial contingent. We've identified a Bane readers who love scotch. That's true. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, what about the, uh, in, and there's a substantial percentage of Bane readers who love um, who like guns a little bit. So what, uh, tell us about his weapon. He's got a special, he's got a 10 millimeter. Um, yeah, he does have a 10 millimeter. He's got a Glock artisanal 10 millimeter. Artisanal sort of. <laughs> um, yeah, he's got, a, he's got a Glock 10 millimeter. Um, that's one of his guns. He, he features, the book features several guns. His primary sidearm is a uh, customized Glock 10 millimeter that's got, uh, it's been, Cerakoted. It's got a custom trigger job. Um, I think I, he, it has night sights. I didn't give him a, a red dot sight on it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and he uses custom made bullets that that are uh, a variety of of metals, and they've got runes scratched into them that are essentially optimized for for dealing with fey and magical threats. Um, and then he's also got um he's got it let's see a smith and wesson j frame he's got a colt delta elite um uh, he uses a vepper 12 um yeah so he he goes through a few guns like, there's not a whole lot of violence and like a, a whole lot of fighting scenes in this but i tried to to make the ones that are in there impactful <laughs> I, I had a lot of fun writing this yeah he uses a couple blades too do you <laughs> You got a background in firearms, uh, apparently. I guess yeah, you do, as, but as you as you, you read out my my bio. official author bio. Uh, um, yeah, I I former army officer, and uh, when I was towards the end of that, really, is when I started getting into uh, civilian defensive carry. Um, so I I was a concealed carry instructor back in Minnesota when I lived there. Um, with my current job, I just I haven't. I haven't done anything with it in, in uh, Michigan, but I, I had that as a side gig for a while. Um, I try and go to shooting courses at least a couple times a year. Um, and then I've also done martial arts my whole life. So I, I tried to incorporate realistic uh, shooting techniques, fighting techniques into the, into the, the fight, the combat sequences. So uh, what are you working on now? Oh, we should mention that story. Uh, that story is called so, Misfits, uh, we were talking about before. And it's yeah. free, and you can get into this world a little bit if you want a taste of it by looking at that. It's free at the Bain website. And after it's down from the main page, it will remain available at in the ebook 20 uh, Free Stories 2021, which you can download mm -hmm. at the Bain website. Ooh. Yeah, that was, that was a lot of fun to write. That was... Um... I got to explore a part of the, the world of this book that isn't really at all touched on in the book, except occasional hints at like, this is, this is a dangerous world. And if you don't know what you're doing, it's very easy to, to get injured or killed. Um, so I got to explore some of the things that can injure or kill you in this world. In that, in that story, I had a lot of fun writing it. Um, but the, uh, my next project is going to be the, the sequel to blood and whispers. Um, I got a, I've been invited to write a short, a sci-fi short story this summer. So that'll, that'll be coming out at some point next year. But that's, uh, um, that'll be a slightly different thing, but the next major project and what I'm currently working on is the sequel to Blood and Whispers. Um, and then beyond that, um, who knows? I, I know I'm at some point I'm going to write a relatively near future sci-fi that kind of looks at you mentioned in, in my author bio that I'm an economist and, and uh, one of the things that I want to explore in my writing is the impact of automation and AI on, on society. Um, so that's, that's kind of going to be the, the theme of, of the first thing I write beyond uh, Quinn's 
sequel. <laughs> well, cool. If it's as richly conceived as this, it should be very cool. Um, is there anything else we want to say about the book that uh, we may not have covered that uh, that you find you might readers might find interesting or we covered a lot <laughs> yeah yeah i don't know i think i think we covered most everything really <laughs> cool well it's uh it's it's really cool he's a deep character with a lot of um with a lot of layers and they get they get nicely peeled away as we discover more and more about mm -hmm. him in the book um the book is blood and whiskers <laughs> blood and <laughs> the blood and whiskers blood and whispers by ac <laughs> haskins here it is again um, Aaron, thank you so much for talking with us about Blood and Whispers today. Well, thanks for having me. Here is another entry in David Weber's Honor Harrington series masterpiece, Uncompromising Honor. Honor keeps her promise. The Salarian League. For hundreds of years, they have borne the banner of human civilization. But the bureaucratic mandarins who rule today's league are corrupt and looking for scapegoats. They've decided the upstart star kingdom of Manticore must be annihilated. Uncompromising courage. Honor Harrington has worn the star kingdom's uniform for half a century. Very few know war the way Honor Harrington does. So far, hers has been a voice of caution. But now the Mandarins have committed atrocities such as the galaxy has not known in a thousand years. They have finally killed too many of the people Honor Harrington loves. Uncompromising vengeance. Now Honor Harrington is coming for the Solarian League, and hell is riding in her wake. And now, David Weber's Uncompromising Honor. System Defense HQ. City of Columbia, Beowulf. Beowulf System. Admiral McAvoy grunted as if he'd just been punched in the belly or stabbed in the heart as Beowulf Beta blew up and took another 11.25 million Beowulfers with it. He wrenched his eyes from the cool, bland lights of the hideous master plot and looked at Dunstan Myers. The ops officer sat staring at the plot, frozen, her expression a mask of grief and failure. Cheryl, he said. She didn't even blink. Cheryl, he said again, more sharply, and she twitched. Then she shook herself and turned to look at him. Yes, sir. She sounded rusty, broken. Same pattern, he asked. Same non-pattern, sir. She grated and chopped one hand savagely at the plot. We don't see anything. Admiral Givens and Commander Lasseline have to be right. Those were both internal explosions. And they may not be the last ones, Cadell Markham said flatly from McAvoy's display. The CNO looked back at the defense director, and Cadell Markham's eyes were as bitter as they were level. In fact, I don't think they were. But, McAvoy began, I know we don't want there to be any more. Cadell Markham cut him off. For that matter, I know neither one of us wants to think about how they got one of these fucking things past us, much less more than one. But they obviously did. And I don't see any reason the bloodthirsty fuckers would stop with just two if they didn't have to. But, McAvoy said in a very different tone, and Cadell Markham nodded. Exactly, he said harshly. If they managed to get more than two through, I know exactly where they'd have wanted to plant the next one. And whatever else they may have had in mind, one thing this damned well is is a message. Beta didn't just coincidentally go up exactly five minutes after Gamma. We've got to get you, all of you, out of there, McAvoy said desperately. How? Cadell Markham asked quietly, and the CNO's jaw clenched as he looked at the man who'd been his boss for the last 70 years and his friend for almost 50. I'm sure the bastards who did this timed it carefully, the defense director continued. They wanted us to realize it was a deliberate interval, that they'd planned it with malice aforethought. But there's no way in hell we could evacuate any of our other habitats in anything less than a full day, and you know it. There are almost 23 million people aboard Alpha. 
It'd take the better part of a friggin' week to evacuate that many people. And even the smallest of the others is over four million. All we'd do if we tried to evacuate would be to induce a panic aboard every habitat. And God knows how many people would be killed if we did. Besides, his nostrils flared. They just love for our people to be running in terror at the moment they die. And I will be damned if we give them that satisfaction. But, my God, sir, Gabe. McAvoy's voice was raw with anguish. It's not just you, it's all of you, all of you at the conference. I know, Cadell Markham said softly. Believe me, I know. They couldn't have realized we'd be up here when they set this up, but we are. And there's no way to get us off in less than an hour either. Maybe they didn't get another one aboard. I hope to hell they didn't, but if they did, they're damned well not waiting half an hour before they blow it. So if that happens, we're not getting out either. And frankly, it would be pretty obscene if we did evacuate when no one else could. McAvoy stared at him silently, and Cadell Markham inhaled deeply. Everybody up here is either talking to his family or recording messages, if they're from out system. I'm sorry, but I need to talk to Joanna now. He flashed a brief, almost smile. Hopefully, I'll be talking to you again in the not too distant too. If I don't, it's been a pleasure and an honor. No, sir, McAvoy said softly. No, sir, the honor's been mine. Now, go talk to your wife. God bless, Corey. You too, Gabe. Whitehaven, Manticore, Manticore Binary System, Star Empire of Manticore. Oh, stop worrying, Sandra. Emily Alexander Harrington looked worn and tired, but her tone was affectionate as her life support chair drifted through the air van's hatch. The sky the van had just left was a dramatic ocean of black-bottomed white as a line of thunderstorms approached majestically from the east and her nostrils flared appreciatively as she inhaled the fresh, clean, rain-is-coming air. It's not like it's anything new, she continued, turning her head to look over her shoulder and smile just a bit crookedly as her longtime companion followed her through the hatch. I don't want to hear any more fussing about it, understand? Especially not today, of all days. It's just, Sandra Thurston began, then paused and looked across at Sergeant McClure. Emily's personal armsman looked back at her, and Thurston drew a deep breath. All right, my lady, she said just a bit sternly. You won't hear any more fussing out of me, but only if you discuss it with her grace. Emily's smile disappeared and her eyes flashed, but Thurston held her ground. You need to discuss it with her, my lady, she said more gently. You know you do. Honor has enough on her mind. Emily retorted, I agree, but you still need to tell her. Thurston shook her head. I'm not making any horrible predictions, she added quickly, but by the same token, you can't let this blindside her, milady. I know you too well to think you want to do that. Emily glowered at her for a moment, but then she drew a deep breath. You're probably right, she conceded. And it's not like there won't be plenty of good news to go with it. No, milady, Thurston agreed, reaching down to rest one hand lightly on her charge's frail shoulder. No, milady, it's not like there won't be plenty of good news. Well, in that case, Emily said, resuming her progress across the Whitehaven landing pad towards the front door, where Nico Havenhurst awaited them. I think the first thing you and I need to do is to take another look at the nursery. She smiled as Sunhard and Barkmaster came bounding across the lawn. I'm thinking Raoul and Catherine are old enough for toddler beds, and that means... She paused, then stopped her chair and turned it to the east, looking back the way they'd come, and her eyebrows rose. Jefferson, were we expecting anyone else this afternoon? No, my lady. Sergeant McClure had already turned in the same direction, and his eyes narrowed as he squinted upward. We're not. 
He pressed the fingers of his left hand lightly to his earbug, never lowering his searching gaze from the incoming thunderclouds, while his right hand drifted towards his holstered pulser. Central, McClure, he said, calling into the Stedholder's guard command center. Do we have an ID on the incoming? He listened for a moment, then smiled broadly and took his hand away from the pulser butt. It's all right, my lady. It's cleared with Central. In fact, it's the Stedholder. Honor. Emily's weariness disappeared and she sent her life support chair drifting back towards the pad. Sunheart leapt lightly into her lap, hitting the moving target with the casual ease of long practice, and Emily chuckled. She ran her good hand lightly down the tree cat's back, and Sunheart buzzed with pleasure. The distant turbine whine resolved itself into grumbling thunder, and Emily's eyes widened in surprise as its source emerged from the clouds. It wasn't an air car. It wasn't even a shuttle. It was a Condor II, an all-up Navy pinnace, and she saw HMS Imperator's hull number blazoned just in front of its forward hatch as it flared and settled on its countergrav. That hatch opened, the landing stairs deployed, and a tall figure in black and gold came down them. Three more figures, these in the green on green of the Harrington Guard, came down the steps at her heels, and she paused as she caught sight of Emily, Thurston, and McClure. She stood still for a moment then squared her shoulders and started toward them, and Sunheart raised her head and stopped purring. Anna, welcome home, Emily called. Honor Alexander Harrington felt her expression tighten. She wanted to stop. She wanted to turn around, reboard the pinnace. She wanted to... What she did was draw a deep breath and keep walking, while Nimitz sat still and silent on her shoulder. Her pinnace's flight crew had violated at least a dozen flight regulations to get her here in time, before the news leaked to the public boards, before Emily could hear it from anyone else. And she could tell from her wife's happy greeting that she'd made it. And oh God, how a part of her wished she hadn't. It's good to see you, Emily said as she drew closer, and Honor tasted her mind glow, tasted the ever-present edge of sorrow, the weariness that went deeper than the merely physical. There was a bubble of joy and anticipation in it this time, though. We just got back from Briarwood, Emily continued. Dr. Illescue says the fertilization went perfectly, and as soon as we can work it into your schedule, he thinks we should. The happy voice broke off as Honor's expression registered. Emily's hand stilled on Sunheart's coat, and the tree cat reached up, her green eyes dark and still and patted her wrist with a gentle, true hand. Emily's gaze flitted to Nimitz, and her mouth tightened. The cat sat hunched on his person's shoulder, the normal mischief in his green eyes quenched, his tail hanging. Honor? Honor went to her knees beside the life support chair. She reached out and caught Emily's live hand, leaned forward, pressed her cheek against Emily's shoulder. Honor? Emily repeated, her voice a bit sharper, her hand tightening on Honor's. I'm sorry, Emily. Honor closed her eyes. The Sollies attacked Beowulf. We just heard. Imperators in Manticore orbit. We receded the report even before Mount Royal. Her voice seemed to waver for a moment and she cleared her throat. I don't have the numbers yet, she husked. And I'm not sure yet how they got past Mycroft. It may be a while before we figure that out, but... They hit the habitats, Emily. Gamma? Beta? Her voice broke, and her shoulders began to shake. Emily tugged her hand out of hers and cupped the back of her head. And Alpha, Emily Alexander Harrington finished very, very softly, tears fogging her own voice, and Honor nodded convulsively, unable to speak. She felt Emily's hand tighten on the back of her head, Felt Emily's grief rising with her own, but then she sensed something else under it as well. A sudden stab of pain that was more than just emotional, more than just spiritual agony. Emily? She pulled back, tear-soaked eyes wide, sudden tension burring her voice. I'm sorry, Honor. Emily sounded hoarse, breathless. I'm so sorry. Emily? 
Honor felt Emily's mind glow rising up, wrapped in grief and yet incredibly powerful, filled with bottomless sorrow and blazing with boundless love. Forgive me, sweetheart. Emily's voice was a whisper, fading even as she spoke. I didn't want it to be like this. I wanted you and Hamish to have each other when... Emily! The cry ripped out of honor Alexander Harrington. She wrapped her arms around the frail body, crushing it in her desperate embrace, even as her mind fought to hold on to that blazing mind glow. Emily, no! No! I love you. The three words were soft, barely a sigh, heard more with heart than with ears. And then that glorious mind glow went out forever. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Uncompromising Honor by David Weber. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a bottle of 12,000-year-old scotch coughed up by an Icelandic glacier in a time machine cooler, obviously sent back for proper aging. Plus, thanks, praise, and gratitude to A.C. Haskins, author of Blood and Whispers. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars. Stars.